fun. Good morning, church. Glad to have you. Oh, I actually got a response. Praise the Lord. There is a good morning. I'm glad to see all of you guys with us, whether you are in the flesh or I cannot see you through the camera, but you can see me, which is a little creepy, but we'll hang in there. Uh, we are in week three of our Suffering Servant, Conquering King series. We are on our way to Easter, and we're looking at the life of Jesus, and we're looking at the reality that Jesus was for us both Suffering Servant and conquering king. And if our example, if our God is that, then how much more so will we have to experience both of those things in our lives? There are times, as you all are well aware, that we go through stuff that we suffer. But there are also times when we are conquerors. And Paul would make the argument that at all times we are more than conquerors because of what Jesus has done for us. So last week we were in the transfiguration, and this week uh, we're going to one of Jesus's parables. But before we get in there, I want to point out that everything in our world has a purpose. And so many of us spend time throughout our lives asking, what is the purpose of life? Or, or more, maybe more personally, what is my purpose in life? Why, why do I exist? Why am I here? And I think it's kind of funny that we ask that question because so many people in this world believe that we have no purpose, that, that we're here by accident and therefore there is no grand design or grand plan. But then why do we ask that question? Well, why, why do we look around at nature and we see things have a form and they have a function? There, there's a reason that certain things exist so that other things are able to exist. You, you just look at the food chain. We have grass so that the grass eaters can eat that, so that the meat eaters can eat that, so that then we can eat those meat eaters. You take one thing out of that chain and the whole system falls apart. God has designed things in such a way that they have a form and a function. And so today the title of my message is, What the King Wants. Because in the kingdom of God, we believe that there is a king. And if we are a part of his kingdom, we have to know, what does he want? It's important for us to understand what is the expectation of life in this kingdom. We understand that our world has rules, it has laws, and we have to abide by those things because there is not only an expectation over our lives, but there is a requirement. I, I don't get to just decide how fast I want to go on the freeway. You know, you know 65, that's a suggestion for me. I want to go 100. I don't actually, that terrifies me. But we have been told this is the way that things are going to be. And if you don't follow that, someone is going to come and let you know that you're doing something wrong. Your behavior should and will be corrected. And we understand that our human system has flaws, but what about God's system? Because we believe that God's system does not have flaws. So we're going to start in the Old Testament this morning in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah writes a song on behalf of God and explains to us something that's going on in his time. So in Isaiah chapter 5, starting in verse 1, it says, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up, cleared it of stones, and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good fruit, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could, I have, what more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland. 
fruit, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. The first point I want to make for us this morning is that the king wants fruit. The king wants fruit. So Isaiah tells us God planted a vineyard, and and he made sure that this vineyard was in the right location. If you're ever involved in real estate, location, location, location. He said it was a fertile hillside. There was nowhere better to put this vineyard. And then what did he do? He cleared it of all the rocks. He put the best vines in it. He put a hedge of protection around it. He built a watchtower so that it could be protected. He put a wine press so that you would have the best results of immediate grapes to the wine press. Get that wine as fast as possible. And what did he get for all of his efforts and all of his work? Bad fruit. Bad fruit makes bad wine. Bad wine is pointless. Just pour it out on the ground. All of your efforts are wasted. And, and what does God say? He, he, he asks the audience, and it's almost like a play is going on. Dear audience, what could I have done differently? What could I have done better? I had the location, I put the best there, I protected it, I watched over it, and what did I get? Jack squat. And then he explains, this is what I'm talking about. Israel, the nation of Israel, is my vineyard. Judah, both both the tribe and then later on this would be the, the country of Judah after the split between Israel and Judah, Where are the vines? Where I'm expecting to see fruit come from. And what did I get? I went to my vineyard, and what did I find? Bloodshed. Injustice. These things that should not have been. Bad fruit. The opposite of good fruit. I'm expecting to show up, and there be righteousness, and justice, and people living for God. But I find the opposite. And what is the response? I'm going to tear this vineyard down. I'm I'm going to remove all the walls that are protecting it. There's going to be no rain over this land. We're done here. Now, Isaiah is, is preaching in a day when God is communicating to Israel that bad stuff is coming because of their unfaithfulness. God is saying that, hey, you guys need to watch out because if you do not repent, Assyria and Babylon, they're going to come in and take you out. And we know, based on both the Bible and history, those things happen. Assyria and Babylon come and take them out. And why did these things happen? Because God had a covenant with his people. Because of my covenant, I am your God and you are my people, and these are the expectations. And because they turned away from that and abandoned God's covenant, just as there were blessings of if you follow my covenant, uh, there will always be rain in your land. You will have the best fruit of every nation. There will never be a miscarriage in your land. What would it be like to be the, the nation where nothing ever went wrong? That is what God promised Israel if they followed everything to the T. But if you do not follow my covenant... There's also bad stuff. There's curses that are going to come upon you and the land. And so what does this passage, because let's be honest, uh, if if you are in this room with me today, uh, we are not covenantal Israel thousands of years ago. The the things that God is saying to Israel do not apply one-to-one with us today. But what do we learn about God in this passage? God cares deeply. He, he, he went to all the effort of investing into Israel, even though I could make the argument he knew they were going to fail. 
that did not stop him from picking the location, clearing the rocks out, making sure that it had a water system and all of these things. It also teaches us that God has expectations. That's something that we miss sometimes. God is expecting something. He comes back to the vineyard. Why? Because he planted it and he wants fruit. I plant a vineyard and there should be grapes. And so he comes and he doesn't find what he expects. And that leads us to ask the question, okay, that was Israel then. What does God expect of me today? And before we answer that question, we have to be careful not to come up with the answer ourselves. Because God is the only one that can answer that question of what he expects. Anytime we think, well, I, anytime we say, well, I think God expects X, and there's no backup, no evidence to follow up with, well, why do you think that? Well, I just feel it. I think that's what God expects of me. That's not okay. The word of God tells us what God expects. And God expects fruit, and sometimes that fruit is effort that we are putting in. We had a great conversation this morning in our Sunday morning Bible study in Corinthians where Paul is talking about some plant and some water. And we talked about how sometimes the fruit that God is looking for is simply our obedience. Show me that you're doing something, and to me that is fruit. We talked about how sometimes our fruit could actually be our failure. Go and tell that person about Jesus. I go and I tell that person about Jesus, and they say no. And yet God is proud of me because what did he want? He wanted me to open my mouth and share. And therefore, my obedience, my human perspective, I failed. My human perspective, they didn't say yes to Jesus, and therefore I didn't do what God wanted. But what if he just said, open your mouth? Go and make disciples. Go and proclaim the goodness of God. So we're going to fast forward to the New Testament now, because we're talking about Jesus, so we should make sure to see from the words of Jesus himself. Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 1. The context of where we're at is that uh, all of the religious leaders are badgering Jesus with questions. They're trying to trip him up. They're trying to figure out uh, what authority Jesus has to speak and to teach, to to be who he says he is. And so Jesus is just throwing out a bunch of parables, not only to teach, but then also to refute some of the stuff that these religious leaders are saying. So, Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it. He dug a pit for the wine press, and he built a watchtower. Gee, that sounds really familiar. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, they beat him, and they sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed." He sent many others, some of, them they bi- some of them they beat, and others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenant said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him. They killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. Another way of phrasing that is they dumped his body over the wall. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. 
Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest Jesus because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Church, what I want us to understand this morning is that I, I in the royal I, I was made to produce fruit. Kind of self-explanatory based on our first one of the king is expecting fruit. But our design and our purpose is to produce fruit. The Bible talks a lot about fruit producing trees. If, if you have an orange tree and it's not producing oranges, what good is it? You're probably going to want to get rid of that tree. Jesus in this parable tells a story, and it starts out, interestingly enough, just like the parable in Isaiah, just like that song. But then it, it changes and it gets different because the focus of Isaiah was about the vineyard itself. The focus of Jesus here is about the tenants of the vineyard, what we will call the leadership of the vineyard. And for, for some historical context for us, renting out of vineyards was common in this time. It's interesting that the region of Galilee, where, where Jesus was predominantly from, a lot of Galilee, the, the vineyards in that region, was owned by foreign investors, essentially. That, that people bought vineyards in Galilee that did not live in Israel, and they had someone else rent it out and take care of it. Not only these foreign people, but the religious leaders that Jesus are talking to, members of the Sanhedrin, the upper echelon of Jewish society, a lot of them were wealthy. A lot of them were predominantly landowners. That's kind of how you get into a high level of authority is you're somebody. You're from a family who owns property. And, and because of that... It's possible that some of the people that Jesus are talking to are actually owners of vineyards who have done this. They own a place and, and then they go away and they have someone else manage it. The idea that Jesus gives is the, 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 the owner of the vineyard is not like, it's not like he's in Rome and, and they're in Israel. He, he's close enough to be able to send people but not far enough away to not have any expectations. It's like uh, you buy a vineyard in Morgan Hill, and then you move up to San Francisco. Close enough to send people, but not too far away. And it was common for these people to have a contract. I own this land. You are going to live here and work here. I get a share of some of the stuff, and you get the rest to continue to plant again in order to create livelihood for you and your family. So in our parable, this owner has an agreement with these people. And what does he do? He has an expectation that he is going to get what he is paying for. He bought the property. He planted everything. He made sure that everything was good to go. Now you just run it for me. So he sends people, but then there is a rebellion. They have decided... You know what? He's not really here that often. We, sh we should own this. We're the ones that are working day in and day out. And so the first guy comes and they beat him. The second guy comes and they beat him and also treat him shamefully. And then the next guy comes and they kill him. And, and we get down this line, and we're not given a specific amount because it's a parable. It's not necessarily a specific instance. It is a story with a purpose. And then at the end, he says, I'm going to send my son. Now, it's possible when they say, look, the son is coming. This wasn't their plan from the beginning. We, we don't get the sense that they've been plotting the whole time that, that we're going to murder the son and then get all this stuff. Well, what does the text actually say? Look, here is the son. They see him coming down the road and they recognize who he is. And they think to themselves, wait a minute, why isn't the owner coming? Is he dead? Because if he's dead and the new owner is coming, if we eliminate him, 
There's no one else to to try and take the property from us. We can claim it as our own because we're the ones that live and work here. That's how society worked in those days. And so they kill the son and, and they dump his body. Like it doesn't say that he is buried. It just says they threw it out of the vineyard. A complete and utter discontempt for this human life. But their theory was a little wrong. Because what happens if you kill the son and there's someone left to avenge him? What does Jesus ask? What is the owner going to do? He's going to show up. And he has the authority to go to the government and get a dispatchment of troops to put this rebellion down. He has the authority to exact revenge and justice. Jesus says he will kill those men. And then the vineyard will be given to someone else. In Isaiah, the vineyard is going to be destroyed. In Jesus' parable, the vineyard is intact, but passed on to someone else. So in in this interpretation, it's interesting because the religious leaders got it. There were a lot of times when Jesus shares a parable and and a lot of people are like, that was a really great story. Ten minutes later, hey, Jesus, I didn't understand that story at all. Could you please explain what that meant? The religious leaders understand the interpretation of this story. The vineyard seemingly is the same as it was in Isaiah. That's probably why their ears perked up. They know Isaiah chapter 5. They know that this vineyard, we're talking about Israel. We're talking about the chosen people of God. And they understand who are the tenants, they're the people in charge of God's people. And throughout Israel's history, God has been sending representatives to Israel to let them know that things aren't the way that they should be. And the Old Testament tells us that pretty much all of the prophets of God are abused by God's own people. A lot of prophets are killed, murdered. A lot of prophets are just abused like none other. And we see that here in the passage. Some they beat, some they shamed, and some they killed. And so we have this pattern of of God sending people, and it's not doing anything. And then God says, I'm sending one last one. My son, my representative, my beloved one. And they interpret Jesus' words as... Jesus thinks he's somebody. Now, they're they're not interpreting sonship in in that way to mean what we know, that Jesus is divine. Otherwise, they would have killed Jesus on the spot. But they are interpreting that Jesus is saying, I'm the best and last prophet you'll ever get. That's their interpretation. And I know that you're going to get rid of me, but the vineyard is going to be taken from you. And we see, both in the Bible and then also in history today, that Jesus' words were fulfilled. The vineyard was taken away from the religious leaders, both in the fact of God's kingdom coming in power, not through the old covenant, but also by the fact that the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed and the Jews had to flee their nation. And so for us today, looking at this passage, we are the others. I will take the vineyard and I will give it to others. And that is you and me. Because we are both the others and we are both the vineyard. Because the vineyard that God was speaking about, when God speaks of Israel, he isn't just talking about ethnic Israel. He's talking about the true people of God, the people who have said yes to him, that like Abraham, our forefather, believed God 
And it was credited to him as righteousness. That we are children of Abraham because we too believe God. That Jesus is who he says he is. And so if we are not only the owners and the vineyard as well, we need to produce fruit. Jesus hasn't threatened us like he threatened the religious leaders of his day that he's going to remove the vineyard from us. We are the church, and we've been told that the church is going to be here until the end. There is no plan C. The plan C is the church, so there's no plan D. It's us. So we're not going to get the vineyard taken away, but we can still be chastised for not producing the fruit and handing it over to him. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, what have I brought to the king? When the king has shown up and asked, I'm here for my share, what do I have to show for it? One way that we do that is through our worship, that we are giving to him what he deserves. And one thing that Jesus deserves is our praise and our adoration. And God said, Jesus said, hey, if, if people aren't going to do this, the rocks are going to do it. Literally, a thing that has no mind is going to praise me. We have been given the responsibility and the ability to worship God. And that is one way that we produce fruit. There are many ways that we do. We're going to jump now to Colossians, our last passage of the morning. Colossians chapter 1 Starting in verse 9, the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church in Colossae, and he says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in, his, in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The last point I want to make is we can bear fruit because of what Jesus has done for us. That this isn't something where I'm an orange tree and I just have to try really hard to make those oranges grow. Jesus has made a way. Jesus has done for us what we could not do for ourselves because we couldn't bear fruit without him. Without Jesus, we cannot bear fruit. I love Paul because he writes run-on sentences like this. As you notice, I'm like waiting for the period so I can take a breath as I read because he wants us to understand this flow and this thought. His prayer, if you actually go back to uh, the second of these slides, he says, we, we pray for you and we continually ask God to fill you. First step, I want God to fill you. Fill me with what? To fill you with knowledge of his will. How? He's going to fill you with the knowledge of his will through wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. What is wisdom? The Bible tells us that wisdom, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And fear of the Lord, we could do a whole sermon series on what the fear of the Lord is. Uh, but whose opinion is most important in your life? Who are you afraid of wronging, harming, or insulting? Sometimes I live in the fear of my wife, who's probably watching this right now, um, and, and wondering, I need to make sure that the words that I say are not dishonoring to her. Everything that I share up here, whenever I share a story about my children or my family or my wife or my friends, 
I want to say it in a way that I make sure that I am not wronging them in any way. In your life, is God the one you're most concerned about? Are you most concerned that you might do something wrong against God? Or do you not really care? It doesn't matter the words that I say or the things that I do. That is the fear of the Lord, that I'm concerned about the things of God. Not, not concerned that a lightning bolt is going to come and strike me. He can do that because he's God. But I am concerned, and I'm concerned in a way that my entire life revolves around him. My fear is my thoughts continually about God, and he is running the show. So back to our Colossians passage. Our prayer is that God would fill you with knowledge of his will, what he wants us to do. And we get that through wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. What did I say? We can't do this without God. So first, Holy Spirit is going to speak to your mind and your heart. And he's going to help you understand what it means to be wise. Not earthly wisdom, but heavenly wisdom. Fear of the Lord. He is going to help you understand what it means to make God your number one priority and give you understanding along with that. Knowledge and wisdom, two different things that are working in conjunction with one another so that I can understand his will. What do you want me to do, God? Sometimes we try and jump ahead in the process and we say, tell me what God wants to do with my life and I don't have understanding or knowledge, uh, understanding or wisdom that the Spirit gives. If you do not fear God, I cannot tell you what God's will is for your life. I can tell you, it's step one, fear God. And we'll go from there. But until then, what God wants for your life, you don't care about. So we're working backwards to ask God to fill you with that knowledge by the power of the Holy Spirit. But that is not God's end goal, church. God's end goal is not so that you would be filled with this knowledge and this wisdom. That's not the end all be all goal. Our problem in the church is when we think that that is the end. Yes, God said that one of our utmost aims in this life is to know God. But it doesn't just stop there. God is not just head knowledge. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Easy. And what does he mean by that? We have a colon there instead of a period because we have the biggest run-on sentence in the Bible. How do we know that we're living a life worthy of God? How do I know that I am pleasing him? Next slide. Bearing fruit in every good work. Growing in the knowledge of God. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. Pause there. We're, we're really diving deep into this passage, folks, because it's important. God gives me all of this stuff so that I bear fruit, because that is his expectation. But bear fruit is one of the things listed here, and we could say that the other things listed are ways that we bear fruit. One of those fruits is growing in knowledge of God. I just got done saying that's not the end all be all, but that is fruit to God. Are you growing in knowledge of him, or have you not learned anything new about God in 10 years? If it's been a while since you're like, that's a new thing, you might want to look into that one. Another fruit is being strengthened with God's power. If you're feeling a little, wor a little weak today, it might be asking Jesus, I need some power. Not, not in your Marvel superhero way of power, but real Holy Spirit power because he wants to empower you to what? Live a worthy life and please him in every way as you bear fruit. 
according to his glorious might, so that another fruit, you may have great endurance and patience. If you're lacking endurance and patience, that might be another fruit you want to target. Jesus, help me grow the fruit of endurance and patience. Another fruit, next slide, and giving joyful thanks to the Father. Thankfulness is a fruit who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. That, that inheritance is not a fruit. You've already been given it. That inheritance is not something that will be taken away because he has qualified you. What did we say? Jesus has done for us what we could not do. We were disqualified. If you've ever watched a sport and you've seen someone get disqualified, they can't do anything to change that. You, you, you watch the, the football player, the basketball player go in, and scream in, in the ref's face when they get a bad call. You, you, you see the, the track star who's just told you couldn't run because of X, Y, Z, and you see the look on their face. There's nothing you can do to change something when the ref or the judge is said, disqualified. And that is what we were before Jesus, disqualified. But God, in his infinite mercy, has qualified me and has qualified you if you've said yes to him so that you might share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light because he rescued us. He cared enough to rescue us from the kingdom of darkness when we were trapped and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. He has given us redemption. He has given us forgiveness of sins. So what else can I do but bear fruit? What else can I do but desire to be what Colossians tells me I should be and I can be? So that when I'm doubting how things are going in my life, I can go back to the word of God. I can open Colossians chapter 1. And I can say, Jesus, the areas that I don't see of this passage in my life, will you help me today? So what is the next step for you? For, for some of us, it, it's being open and, and saying, Jesus, come and help me out with this. How, how do you deal with the sick tree? You have to prune it. You got to cut some stuff off. And that's hard and that's difficult for us sometimes. When we know that we have some rot in our life. And we know that coming to Jesus means being willing for it to get cut off. And our unwillingness keeps us from God. So saying, Jesus, will you show me the areas that I need to get pruned today? For others of us, it, it's looking at the fruit, and maybe we do some self-pruning. If, if you're ever into pruning, you don't just cut off the dead stuff. Sometimes you cut the live stuff that just isn't doing well. So if there's an area in my life that is good, but because that's happening, I'm stopping myself from doing something that's great. I need to be honest with God and be like, do I need to stop the good thing so I can make room for the great thing? Is there something that I need to sacrifice to give up for your kingdom, God? And for others of us, It, it's just literally when, when I say next step is taking that next step. I am producing fruit. I am doing good. But what is next? What is the next step for me, Jesus? I want to produce more fruit. Will you show me that today? I'd like to invite the worship team to come up as we're going to continue to worship the Lord through song and through communion. I'd like to invite Heather and our communion team up as well, but let's pray. Jesus, I thank you, God, for your word. 
I thank you, God, when your word is challenging to us. That in this passage, God, you you once again show us that you would suffer. That the son is going to be beaten and killed by the tenants and thrown out of the vineyard. Jesus, you did that for us. You suffered on our behalf so that we might experience forgiveness of sins that Colossians told us about. Jesus, I pray, God, that that we not only hear the word, but respond to the word. God, we are in a season as a church that needs to bear fruit. And that is going to require effort. It's going to require teamwork. It's going to require pruning. And so, Jesus, continue to show your grace and your mercy on this house and on our lives. Continue to stir within our hearts, God. I believe it's the desire of people in this room that we would bear fruit. Help us to do that in greater and greater measures. We surrender ourselves to you today, Jesus. In your name we pray.